Good afternoon. Welcome to another Travel Perspective production uh, this afternoon, which is entitled Real Heritage, the Social Media and Marketing Challenge. My name is Steve Keenan. I'm the other half of Travel Perspective. You've just seen Mark in action. Uh, today we've got a panel rather than an interview seminar, which holds great promise, and I'm very excited to be, to be moderating this session. Um, before we start, just two notices. Thanks again to 4Engage, who are our sponsor partners for the social media seminars this year at World Travel Market, our seventh year of World Travel Market social media. And also to remember Slido, sli.do, hashtag WTMLDN, uh, where you can propose your questions, and we'll have a Q&A with the audience towards the end of the session. You'll be reminded of that later on, but there's going to be an awful lot of questions today, I'm sure. So, as of July this year, there are 1,073 World Heritage Cultural or Natural Sites recognized by UNESCO. The number rises all the time, and there are 21 added this year, including the Lake District here in the UK. Other new entries prove the eclectic nature of the list. A Russian cathedral, an Argentinian national park, a wharf in Brazil, and a lead, silver, and zinc mine in Poland. Coincidentally, the UN is declared 2017 as the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development. It is a year when the issue of sustainable tourism and overcrowding again moved up the tourism agenda. And it's concern to several World Heritage sites. Tourism is swamping Venice and Amsterdam. The Alhambra in Spain and Machu Picchu in Peru have introduced time ticketing to control numbers. World Heritage cites all of them. And however much visitors to Peru are encouraged to visit Quilap in the north, all will still want to see Machu Picchu as well. It's an issue UNESCO is acutely aware of, and it's one we will look to address in isolation today. We shall also consider how social media and digital can help, or can it? All of my speakers today think it can help. We have Carlo and Joseph, who are the social media managers, respectively, of Puglia in Italy, known for its Trudy houses, and the Czech Republic, where Prague is another city under siege. We have travel blogger Gary Arndt, who, as of last week or two weeks ago, has visited 342 World Heritage sites. He also happens to have 171,000 Twitter followers. And we also have James Rebanks, who is a shepherd, who not only helped his home district of the Lake District win heritage status, but who is also the author of a best-selling book and UNESCO's World Heritage Sustainable Tourism Toolkit. He also is Britain's best-known shepherd with 100,000 Twitter followers. But first, I'd like to introduce, on the far side, Peter De Bruyne, who is the Senior Project Officer for UNESCO's World Heritage and Sustainable Tourism Programme, a very big, important title. Peter will outline what UNESCO's latest plans are for the programme and how he sees the issues facing the world's greatest cultural and natural tourism attractions. Peter, would you like to come to the stage? Round of applause, please, for Peter De Bruyne. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Well, World Heritage, I think most everybody knows about World Heritage sites. And perhaps people know that UNESCO's goal is to safeguard and protect these sites. But Probably what's lesser known is why these sites are inscribed on the World Heritage List. And one thing in common of all World Heritage Sites is they all have something that we call outstanding universal value. And there's different criteria regarding this outstanding universal value. And it manifests itself in different ways. I mean, some World Heritage Sites are extraordinarily beautiful. Others are industrial processes or 
engineering achievements. So we always say that World Heritage isn't necessarily a beauty contest. But it's this system, this global system, which has created some of the most iconic tourist destinations in the world. So another thing in common for most World Heritage sites is tourism. People want to see them. People want to visit them. And now they're becoming more popular than ever. We're seeing many of these iconic places overcrowded. They're being overwhelmed by tourism numbers. We have a new concept called over-tourism. And how that's impacting World Heritage Sites is obviously a very, a very important concern for UNESCO. Because we believe fundamentally that tourism should enhance this outstanding universal value, not detract from it. And so the World Heritage Sites across the globe should the tourism associated with them should have that same value. And this is something that UNESCO is striving to achieve in the long term. And I think, on the one hand, this idea of over-tourism is perhaps a question of management. We hear a lot about management of World Heritage Sites, and that's something that my program that I coordinate has looked at very carefully in trying to give World Heritage Site managers tools to help them better manage tourism or manage tourism more sustainably. But it's much more complicated than that. World Heritage Sites and tourism associated with World Heritage Sites is very complex. Tourism is a very complex economic system. There's many, many, many stakeholders. There's very complicated governance structures associated with many World Heritage Sites. But there are policy levers that can be put in place. So there is a very fundamental role of the government to help us in the management of these sites. But the private sector also has a role. The private sector talks to the travelers. They create tourism products. So their role will be critical in terms of managing tourism. And the communities themselves, what we've seen this past summer in Barcelona and Venice, you have the communities pushing back against tourism. You have protests. You have scrawled graffiti saying, tourists go home. That is in no one's best interest. We have to change the system. And of course, it's us. It's the travelers. What's our role in all this? How is our behavior making a negative impact even more severe. And we're traveling in huge numbers. And we're traveling from countries that perhaps weren't sending travelers, international visitors, to the global stage like they are now, like China and India and Brazil. But one thing I think we should all have in common is to strive for this high quality visitor experience. The theory, or my theory, is that if you go to a World Heritage Site and you have a good experience, chances are that site's well managed. It's well managed in terms of conservation, and it'll probably be well managed in terms of tourism. So they go hand in hand, this idea of a very high quality visitor experience and management. And of course, mar marketing and communication are very important. We know that World Heritage sells. And how we communicate, how we market to change this, to get people to travel at different parts of the year, for instance, in shoulder seasons, or to tell us more about festivals that occur in March and November, or tell us about other places and things to experience and spend another night. Social media is going to be key to all this, to take us, to tell us to take the time to learn about the stories, the amazing people doing amazing things. Our digital lives had changed the traditional tourism marketing funnel, and we need to reach tour, um, consumers at each level, at every single point along that funnel, from inspiration to learning to sharing. 
So understanding this, um, UNESCO has trying to see how we can demonstrate a new kind of travel or a new kind of experience or a new kind of traveler. And um, this, um, this concept of, of traveling differently, I think, is, is, is the future if we are going to manage tourism at World Heritage Sites more sustainably, and if we can sort of reverse this concept of over-tourism. So what we've done is, with um, the support of the European Union, we're developing an online partnership, or online platform, sorry, um, in partnership with National Geographic to see if we can make this kind of an impact. It's, the idea is to inspire people to travel differently and travel deeper and to discover the hidden gems of the European Union, to perhaps look at things differently at a different angle and reveal the stories about Aquileia in Italy or Drattingholm in Sweden and not necessarily Venice or Florence. We want you, through this platform, to discover the cellars of Champagne or Tokai or the romanticism of the Lorelei Valley in Germany. So this idea of when you're, when you're traveling, to take the time to see things, to taste things, to talk to people. We don't talk to people anymore. We're the selfie traveler where we spend two hours at a destination and then you're on to the next one. And I think this is more acute in the big cities here in London. How many World Heritage Sites do you, do you think are here in London? There's actually four. Two of them get the bulk of the international visitors. The Tower of London and Westminster. Kew Gardens does it. So this idea of, of seeing when you're at a destination and taking the time before you travel to see what's there, to see if there's a festival, to see about gastronomy, to see about crafts, to see about a festival, is what is going to change things. And the idea of traveling for the sake of traveling changes. It'll be traveling for the sake of having a meaningful and deep experience. So overall, we really want to increase sustainable tourism at World Heritage. And this idea of increasing the length of stay, because that is directly linked to sustainable development for those communities. So that value and that valorization of World Heritage is achieved through tourism in this regard and then raising support for World Heritage because for UNESCO, for many of these systems, these World Heritage sites, they're needing funding. Public funding is on the decline across the board in every country. So we have to get smarter, we have to be innovative, and we have to be creative. And tourism can be that vehicle to help us do that. Um, the, the side, I mean, the, the the platform itself was going to be featuring 34 sites in Europe in 19 countries. And again, some of these you'll notice are, are iconic. We have the Palace of Versailles, for instance, that's part of the project. Versailles probably doesn't need any more international visitors into the palace. They do, however, want visitors to spend time in the gardens. People don't go to the Versailles gardens. They don't spend time in the Trianon. So even Versailles has a goal of spreading tourism over a season, spreading tourism within a property, getting people away from those must-see points into other areas. This is how we're going to change it. So I think it's this idea of inspiring people is what UNESCO wants to do. We love storytelling. That's what this platform will hopefully achieve. So uh, with that, I'll end my, my brief remarks, and thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Peter, for a brilliant overview of where UNESCO is at the moment. Um, and you set yourself quite a challenge there, haven't you? That's not going to be achieved in five minutes. Is this an ongoing rollout program? I think, I think it's the efficient ball up the, <laughs> the hill. It's, I mean, it's, it, it's huge, but one of the many interesting points you raised there was if 
a World Heritage Site focuses on maximizing, maximizing the experience and does a good presentation of hotels, food festivals, then it usually means that it's well run and well managed. Is that a small minority of these sites you're talking about in Europe, or is it the majority? Well, I think it happens, you'll see it happening within every probably destination on, on certain scales. Overall, certainly, I mean, there, there are places where you can go, like the, we just, we spent some time in the upper middle Rhine Valley. Um, it's, a, it's a fairly large site, it's a cultural landscape as we describe it. And, and it is well run, and it's kind of a mature destination, so the tourism industry there is, is um, very well managed, and the flows are managed well, and so, so there are those cases where it happens. It's not every place in Europe is, is Venice or Barcelona. Yeah, and somewhere like Versailles, it's up to the people there, isn't it, to switch, sell them from the house into the gardens? Is there enough education on site to be able to persuade people to move within one complex? Well, that, that, that's, I think that's, that's where we can make a lot of innovation, is how, within a site, we can get people to move from one, one, one point to the other. And I think, um, for UNESCO, that's an opportunity for interpretation. So, you know, you start to tell a story right there and capture them, and then lead them into that direction. So, you know, Versailles is doing that now. In fact, one, one of the things that... Um, that Versailles is doing is usually in the winter the gardens are closed. So they now have an exhibit, an outdoor exhibit. So they're encouraging people to go to the gardens and it's free because usually it costs, there's two charges for the palace and the gardens. Okay. Well, I'd like to introduce James who wants desperately to jump in quite right at this point. James Rebanks, as I mentioned in the introduction, has been, uh, his family have been raising sheep in the Lake District for 600 years passionate supporter of cultural landscapes and works with the UNESCO from this viewpoint. So James, do you think UNESCO is sort of morphing and changing its approach as well from the Lake District, which has just become a UNESCO site, your role in it, it's taken from a different point of view? I, I, I think so, yeah. Certainly with cultural landscapes, it feels to me like the approach is changing quite rapidly. So some of the research I did with Peter several years ago now, um, uh, when we asked, asked sites and site managers why they'd become a World Heritage Site, it was, it was a mixed bag going back a few years, wasn't it? So for some people it was a badge of recognition to say they'd already preserved it. Um, uh, yes, for some people it was a sort of marketing tool, and you just have to walk around the convention centre here to see how many different countries, how many different destinations are using their World Heritage Sites. It really does sell, as Peter says. But there's a growing... At the time I started looking at this, there was a, a small number of sites doing this, are using it for what, what's called placemaking. So it was a, a, a real driver about sort of social and economic regeneration of that place, um, particularly with the cultural landscapes. So if you take somewhere like the Lake District or some of the vineyard World Heritage Sites, they're telling you that they're really special because of, of a kind of agriculture or a kind of culture, yeah. but that raises a big problem, doesn't it? How do you keep that alive? Mm -hmm. And if you haven't got the answer for how you're going to keep it alive, there's a mismatch there. So, um, and there are more and more of those sites at the moment where it's becoming quite a radical yes. move to try and drive changes to keep something alive that people care about. Well, you, you mentioned conversation the other day, the terraces, rice terraces in the Philippines. Yep. That's the sort of thing you're thinking about as well? Yeah, I mean, if we, the, the truth is we live in a highly globalised, cheap food industrial world, and if we don't do things to protect those cultural landscapes, particularly the economics of them, then they're going to disappear. And that's as true of the rice terraces in the Philippines as it is of some of the Italian cultural landscapes, as it is of the Lake District. So it's very useful to ha have the, the world endorse the specialness of the place, but that's really just the start of the process, isn't it? If, if you want to keep a historic economic system alive, you need to have some pretty radical, progressive ideas about how you're going to do that. So you, you went on Twitter three or four years ago with the purpose of telling people about the life of a shepherd and how important that is to the landscape? Uh, yes, to cut a long story short... Um, um, I was a little bit annoyed with how the story of my landscape was sold. So um, I was looking at the way the electricity was sold, particularly about 10 years ago, and to me it was all about leisure. It was all about escape from people. Um, it was a sort of beautiful myth of what our landscape is, and I could entirely understand why that was appealing to other people who wanted to come, but it felt to me like the people of the landscape were voiceless. Yeah. Um, so both in my Twitter account and, and in the book I wrote, I wanted to try with whatever gifts I have to try and tell that story, try and make other people see those things. And 
and my belief is when you travel to India or you travel to China, uh, the outstanding universal value, value is really important, but it's an even richer trip if you get to meet the local people, you get to understand their culture, you understand their sense of identity and where they're coming from. Um, and I'll, I can say more than Peter because I'm not employed by UNESCO. I think until very recently, most World Heritage Sites were pretty lousy at telling their story, both their OUV story, the outstanding universal value, but also the story of the, the host community. Mm. And you just have to walk around today as I have to see, A, there's a lot of money flying around around tourism. B, there's massive flows of people going to all sorts of places, which is generally a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you don't have to have very much imagination or awareness of the world to realize that that can quickly go wrong. Unless we, we give voices to the people in those communities and we're listening to them, yeah. it can go badly wrong. So many points within that. So when the Lake District, um, and, you, and you largely helped the Lake District to find its way to achieving world heritage status. I, I, would, I wouldn't take too much credit. I think a lot of you, people did that. You largely helped. Yeah. Um, do you, is it your belief or understanding or, or desire that the Lake District now puts into practice this thinking of who they are, the cultural landscapes, how they keep that history and heritage alive as well all the way through, not just yep. having a museum and a, an iconic attraction. Uh, totally. My, my support for it is absolutely about that. So I happen to care very much about uh, preserving around the world a diversity of different historic agricultural systems. I happen to believe modern food production in many ways is unsustainable and we're going to need to go back to systems that need less antibiotics, etc., etc. So... <laughs> I think you have to, if you're going to care about those historic systems, you have to have some really smart thinking about the economics of it. How can we get the visitors to my landscape who spend over £2 billion a year? How can we make sure that that money is sustaining the historic farming? Yeah. How can we get the farmers to open up their farms and share their culture and their mm -hmm. flocks of sheep with those visitors? And try to join all of those things up in a way that they, didn't, they weren't joined up 20 years ago. Very good. Now, Carlo, who is social media manager for Puglia Promotion, uh, you'll recognize a lot of what James has just said in your region with Alborobello is the yeah. biggest concentration of the, tr you know, the treaty houses, the conical houses. Uh, would you say that keeping those alive and keeping that story alive of the yeah. original reason for those houses is important to you? Yeah, uh, um, I think that I agree uh, with the, uh, almost everything that James, James just said because uh, I think that um, it, it is very important to tell the, the stories about around there is, a, there, is, there is around the destination, you know. and social media is are, is, are very helpful in doing this. Um, Albero Bello, for instance, is, is for sure the the, the uh, village of ten thousand people living there, but it, where there is the biggest concentration of this building, these dwellings you just mentioned, with this conical roof, they are very. Uh, unique. Uh, it's a, 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 a very beautiful landscape when you are in front of them, but probably one, many tourists that get there do not know that all the, that area, the uh, Itria Valley area, is full of these uh, buildings as well. Yeah. So Alberobello is the biggest concentration of, of, of this play of these houses, but also around it. And you can tell it's uh, driving people through Twitter or Instagram or Facebook uh, to find out uh, uh, more about the destination, find out how people build these uh, houses, what they do, uh, how they live there. Yeah. Considering then out of 1,500 um, trulis in the, in the uh, city center of Alberobello, 500 are uh, the houses of local people, and uh, 500 are uh, um, have been converted into uh, B and B or bed and breakfast or restaurants uh, or yep. shops, and uh, uh, so th there is a lot of stories to tell about this destination, in my opinion. Okay, we'll come back to that. Joseph, the social media manager of the Czech Republic, as well. That again, you you, you have this issue of Prague. I think you say 65, 70 percent of visitors to the Czech Republic don't leave Prague. So the same principle as, as London and Amsterdam and other places. But you are trying to encourage visitors to spread the wings away from Prague itself. And you're, you've been using social media and video as well. Can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, when can I start? Yeah, as you mentioned, that there is a, let's call it a big little problem, that 65 to 70% of tourists coming to Czech Republic 
uh, stays in Prague and they don't travel around the country. And uh, we have uh, 12 UNESCO sites, UN World Heritage sites in Czech Republic. And luckily, uh, the most of them, 11 of them, aren't in, uh, in Prague. They are spread around the country. And right now, as a national tourist board, we are shifting to using the social media platforms such as Facebook or, from my point of view, the better one is Instagram. And through the influencers, we are trying to encourage tourists to explore uh, different uh, regions and different parts of the Czech Republic. For example, last year we did the project with the U.S. bloggers that are focused on, uh, on uh, sustainable tourism. And they went to the region, they explored the region, and then wrote an article and prepare a video, prepare video make, a, make a video of UNESCO sites in a certain region that, is, uh, that has uh, like not that much tourists uh, from abroad. And I think... It has this is very close to Prague as well, so it's yeah. not a long hike. And what you just mentioned, that's another, another challenge that we will have to, through the social media, explain to the tourists that these sites, the UNESCO heritage, uh, are like easy to reach from Prague. For example, this region is uh, one hour, one hour and a half driving by car by, on a highway. So it's really easy to reach. And there, in the region, there are three sites close together. And do you think video is the best way to... I saw the video that these bloggers did, which is a lot of aerial footage. Um, we couldn't, I couldn't download the film because it's protected, but you know, next right. time we'll show that. <laughs> but I do think the video showing these three sites within a day's reach of Prague is, to me, I didn't know that. If I knew that, if that message is spread out that it's achievable, it's not difficult to get to these other places, and they are magnificent to see as well. Mm -hmm. Now, Gary, 342 sites down the road, vast social media following. Huge fan of UNESCO sites, a huge fan of social media. You've heard a lot of points here. What, what strikes you from the conversations we've had? The biggest problem... Is this on? I hope so. No. Uh, the biggest problem is that there are only so many places in the popular consciousness. So when someone wants to go on holiday, they're thinking the canals of Venice, the Eiffel Tower, Big Ben, and they don't know of anything else. I recently read an interview with the uh, person who runs the Louvre, 80% of the visitors to the Louvre go to see the Mona Lisa and leave. So the problem is they just don't know of anything else. Mm. And it's just a matter of raising awareness of these other places. But social media can do a great deal to do that. Absolutely. Uh, I've been, there's a bunch of places I've been promoting for years. Uh, one is Sukhothai, uh, which is located between Bangkok and Chiang Mai. Everybody goes to Bangkok. A lot of people go to Chiang Mai. I've been telling people, no, this place that's in the middle is great. You've got to go there. And I've had you know, dozens of people over the years that say, yeah, we stopped there and it was fantastic. A mm -hmm. uh, 20-minute train ride from Venice is the city of Padua. It has the oldest botanical garden in the world. It has the Scrivingi Chapel, which will soon be a World Heritage Site. It has one of the largest public squares in Europe and a fantastic cathedral. And everyone ignores it because they want to go to Venice. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a matter of raising the awareness because there are so few places in the popular consciousness and they want to see those places. And you just need to expand what it is. And a good example is Skellig Michael in Ireland which is, I think, a fantastic place. Nobody knew about it. And then Luke Skywalker went there. And now the number of people that want to go to Skellig Michael has exploded mm. because it got into the popular consciousness. Mm. But with this number of sites coming on all the time, the, the need to promote more and more sites, is that must be down to the individual, individual sites as well as the DMO rather than UNESCO to push this, this, this awareness. Well, it, it, it is a problem because they're consistently making more. And... All of the big iconic places were inscribed years ago. So the Great Wall of China, the Taj Mahal, the pyramids, those were the early ones. And now the average person, if they were to look at the latest list of World Heritage Sites, they would say, I have no idea what this is. Yeah. And so uh, I think there is a dilution that's happening, especially in Europe, because there are so many European sites mm. and there are so many medieval towns and so many you know, things like that, uh, that, that it can be kind of confusing. And I think there needs to be more promotion of what exists rather than more and more countries just continually trying to get another World Heritage Site every year. But the idea of denoting the sites are known for underground romantic, that must surely help to delineate what they are. It can certainly help. And I think more countries, and, I, and I, I've told countries that I've worked with, to do something to link their sites together. 
I know in the United States, the National Park System has a passport. You can buy it, and then you go to every park, and you get a stamp. Mm. And so a lot of people, uh, they'll buy passports for their kids, and they go out of their way to visit a national park, and they stamp it. Yes. And I think a pan-European, or at least something that's done um, within a country, a similar program where you could get a stamp or something to encourage people to get to some of these other locations would be a great idea. Okay. Now don't forget to put your questions in on slide OSLIDO, hashtag WTMLDN. I'm sure we'll see the questions up soon. James, you want to come in on yeah, that? Yeah, I was just going to chip in. When I, when I walk around the, the sort of convention hall today, I, I sometimes want to shake the designers who work for tourism marketing people, to be perfectly honest. I think if you, if you, were, the, if you were walking down a, a, an aisle with lots of different countries on either side and nobody had ever shown you a picture of their country and one country put up a picture of a beautiful beach with a sandy uh, shore, you'd all go to that one because that's unique. But when I walk around, I see about 80% of the country showing me exactly the same things. And, and my frustration is, uh, I think many of the marketing people and the design people that work in tourism don't necessarily understand outstanding universal value or, or, or haven't had the training or, to, or the support to really get to grips with it. And one of the best examples of that was I worked with Peter in Malawi at Lake Victoria. We were in uh, this small fishing community called Cape McClear for several days before we heard anybody talk about fish. And it's actually a World Heritage Site because of the cichlid fish that are under the surface of the water. And there's lots of wonderful things about going to Malawi and lots of wonderful things about Cape McClear, but they just weren't telling you the most important story they've got. So well, yeah. I, I think joining up the tourism marketing people and design people and yeah. the people who know about the heritage much, much more mm. can give you a really unique story that makes you stand out. Well, it's something we dis discussed on the phone again the other day. The, it's the opportunity for the places to tell the story of how they wish to be perceived by the world as well. So it's an obvious story to go in on the fish. Well, in Julio and in the Czech Republic, do you encourage your, w your World Heritage Sites to think who they are, how to portray themselves from the ground up? Do you have to do the job for them or they should be doing it themselves? Uh, that's a good question. And uh, I think right now we should focus more on that because when I did the research last week, for example, about our uh, world heritage, the most like well known like the Prague or Český Krumlov or uh, Lednice Valtice area, uh, they are not using the social media enough and I think they have the content but they put it on on the web pages at least. Yeah. So we need to we need to prepare a train program and tell them how to use it. That, for example, they should uh, they should use a unique hashtag for for social media for Instagram. Well, and there's a question here, uh, which is the top question. Storytelling comes out as a key theme here. Out of the panelists, work the content creators see them supporting distribution plans. Well, you've already said that you've worked with the U.S. Uh, videographers. I think you're working with Czech-based content creators as well, aren't you? But who can tell the story for external markets? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Right now, we are preparing the two episodes uh, of uh, YouTube videos, each around seven minutes, with the Czech influencers. And these guys are focusing on uh, explaining the story of Czech Republic to foreigners through educating them. For example, the first, uh, first episodes were about uh, how to get from the airport to the city center and don't get rid of, like, that you should go straight to the public transport. Then they are educating sure. what, what are the traditional Czech suites and what type you can, you can get uh, to your... Uh, it, should, do you want information or inspiration? Both. I think it's both, right? But James? Uh, the, other, the other thing to say is that there's a temptation to think that interpretation and storytelling happens when you get to the site. Actually, it starts way, way before. It starts about 18 months before when somebody starts putting a package together and thinks about how they're going to sell it. Yeah. Yeah. It happens in the, uh, the, the travel agents in the country where the people go in to learn about the place. There's a whole bunch of stuff. By the time you get to Versailles, you've probably decided that you've come for the palace. Mm. Um, it's, it's way before that that you actually need to convince them, in many cases, that they want to have a look at the garden. Is, so that, is that in your toolkit? And as Gary was saying about the new sites coming on are quite obscure now. They, Presumably, UNESCO have done the big ones. They've done the Venices and the Amsterdam, so they don't, you're now looking at elsewhere. But has your criteria for World Heritage Site changed? And B, are you telling these people in the process of applying for status that they have to be planning this story and how they tell it 
in the future as well? Or do you still well, leave it to them? Well, it's more about, I mean, we're, we're looking at the World Heritage List very um, long term. And there's underrepresented you know, sites that fit certain criteria. So we're encouraging those more, more of those sites. So there is that effort within, within the UNESCO system too, to look at not only um, the criteria, but countries that are underrepresented in terms of world heritage. Um, but yes, there are nominations from France and Spain and Italy. Um, but again, it, it, I, think, I think for this, you know, linking that, the, the criteria to the outstanding universal value, what I said, it, it is through storytelling. But one, one of the things that I was struck is that, yes, uh, there are content creators, but some of the best storytellers are in those Absolutely. communities. And, that, and there's one right now with James. I mean, yeah. And they're the ones, you know, if we can bring that out and bring that to life, when, when people are thinking about traveling, and, and it's the same with Sukuta, you know, it's this, this helping people discover things at, at each stage of, the, of, their, of their traveling. It's, it, it's going to be really important. Um, and, and, the, and the people in those communities quite often have the passion and the enthusiasm about that subject. But they don't have the knowledge of how to tell that story. No, right. well, I think some of them do. I think they just need a little bit of help. Um, yeah. Sort of passion and enthusiasm are infectious, aren't they? You can make people interested in fish beneath the, beneath the waves of Lake Victoria or in sheep farming in the Lake District or whatever else it is. Yeah. There's, um, there's a I think there's a tendency in tourism marketing circles to be a little bit too conservative, to think people only want beaches, they only want medieval castles. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more to most places that can be brought out. I well, I, th I think it's another conversation to be had, but experiential tourism is yeah. not doing the castle, but getting into the... Carlo, you're going to come in. Yeah, uh, I, I think that the, the best way is to work together with the, 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 travel, the local travel industry, first of all, and the local people as well, to give voice to them. To, if they are passionate, but they don't know how to use, probably, how to produce a video content or to broadcast or whatever it is, you can... Uh, work together with them. Yep. Uh, I make an example. We just did it with a, a park in the in Puglia. That they produced the video. We put the uh, social media channels that are powerful than more powerful than their social media channels to uh, share this video and to make it seen across the web the, and the social. So they, they worked with the video and then we worked with communication. Yep. And uh, so this is the, the the best way. And because. Uh, I mean, we, we are far from, still far from being like Venice and, and, uh, and Barcelona or uh, uh, Amsterdam, whatever. Uh, uh, I think, personally, I think that, that the biggest risk for a, risk for a, um, a tourist play is to become full of only tourists, mm. somehow to become fake then. So, uh, most important thing is to to give value to the people who live there, who, who know the story, and uh, to tell together this story, let's say. Gary, you've heard all this again. The stories are there, and he's a bit of help and training to get those stories out, to put them, put them to a public. Would you agree with that? Are you the person to do and help these people? I'm one of them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something I've been doing ever since I've been starting traveling. And I, but I think it's also a matter of uh, letting people know they have a very narrow, most people have a very narrow viewpoint of what universal value is. <coughs> there was an article in The Guardian this summer <coughs> about the worst World Heritage Sites in the world. And I was in Sweden at the time visiting World Heritage Sites, and they listed like three or four from Sweden. And they were all industrial heritage sites. And the industrial heritage sites are my favorite ones. Like if you go to Blenavin in Wales, uh, or I visit the Inglesburg Iron Works in Sweden, and things like that, because these are things which are rather new, mm. but the industrial revolution and how this modern world came to be is a really important story. Like, it's really important. And these things, in, in many cases, they're still around. We can preserve them. And, but people, it's like, no, it's a cathedral, a castle, a Roman ruin, or, you know, it's not old enough for me. And so we have to expand the notion of what that is. And it, it's getting the story out there. So it needs to be uh, promoted on social media, through mass media, or whatever means we can, but letting people know that these things exist. Was that industrial site in Sweden one of the worst? No. Mm -hmm. It was just there. Oh, it was on the Guardian list, yeah. Yes, yeah. It was, and it didn't make any sense to me whatsoever because it was, again, it was just this very narrow notion of what should be a World Heritage Site. And it's like, oh, it has to be, like I said, 
old castle, old cathedral, just that sort of stuff. Oh, that's like, what I like thought cultural landscapes yeah. change. <clears throat> I was, uh, like the point I made about it being a beauty contest, yeah, it's absolutely. really not. And, these, and this platform that I was talking about, it's one of the themes that we are grouping some of these sites is called Underground Europe. And it's, a lot of the sites are mining sites, and they aren't very, you know, a slag heap is, is it's not that beautiful. But it's very, very interesting. And that's, you know, and it's, it's a kind of, ex, you know, a different kind of experience that you will get there. And it is linked to our the human story and how Europe has evolved. So it, it, a local story becomes a global story when you share that. And, and that, that sharing that is so important. And that's tourism. And, that, and, that, and that's the connection. And, and I think it's interesting, some of these, like one of the sites um, this year was the fourth bridge. You know, it's, it's a bridge. And how many millions of people cross that bridge, have seen that bridge, even here in the UK, and don't understand that history, how that very important yeah, history. Lovely. Um, the Iron Bridge, you know, same thing. That, that was the birth of the Industrial Revolution. Ha here in, you know, in, 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 in Shropshire, up, up, up in, up in yep. England. So it's these, it's these kind of things that I think that, you, even with industrial heritage, I mean, there's, there's a lot of geeky engineers out there. Let's get them going to these sites. You know, again, it's this inspiration because it's not, you know, how many, how many Gothic cathedrals do you, will, will, one, will a traveler actually see in, 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 one, in one visit? There's a professor on the Jurassic Coast. I forget, apologies to the professor whose name I've forgotten. But I once stood on a beach on the Jurassic Coast in the south coast of England. And this guy picked up a pebble from the beach. And for 45 minutes, he had me and about 30 other people in the palm of his hand while he told us the story of the geology of that beach all through this pebble, yeah. which he'd put on the beach 45 years earlier as part of a test pile. Um, that man's sheer enthusiasm yeah. is carrying you along on that. Well, that's the, the people as well. That's the, yeah, getting exactly. that connection. Now, tell me about China. China overtakes Italy next year as the country with the most World Heritage sites. Right. And I think you told me, Peter, that there's 50% year-on-year -year growth of visitors to these sites in China. Yeah. Now, that's, that's what are all nice. these new sites in China? Are they the old-style castles and gorges, or what, what are they? Give me an idea of China as well. Well, I mean, I mean, the China, as you can imagine, it's a huge country. It's very diverse. It's extremely diverse. And, and in China, you're seeing more natural sites coming on board. So it's interesting how the Chinese are, are looking at world heritage. You have, um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's incredible in China because they, um, they have a different concept of visitation, obviously, because just the sheer numbers and how, they, they, um, how people access the sites is perhaps different than, than it is in, in the West. But uh, I think a common thing, and, and what, what you're seeing with the Chinese is, is they're, they, they, they're, they're traveling in different, in different ways. You know, there was a traditional um, evolution of, of, of international visitors, and you see that with Chinese coming to Europe, where, where they would come in big numbers, big tour buses, but the Chinese, are, it's everything. There's independent travelers, and, and those numbers are really high, and they, and, and they want something different. And, and, that, and we're seeing that in them discovering their own heritage in China, and they're traveling in huge numbers national, with national tourism, but now they're coming to other places. And, and actually, they've got some of the greatest challenges, but they've also got some of the best ideas about how to deal with them. And yeah. Some of the most innovative thinking in the world at the moment about tourism management, flow management, carrying capacity, all that stuff. Uh, managing flow to keep people outside of the delegate bits of the site. They have to. The cutting edge stuff are in the world. A lot of it's coming out of China at the moment, there, dealing with that problem. Yeah, there's a site. Um, it's the it's, uh, Magao Grados. There are these fourth century Buddhist cave paintings. Incredibly fragile environment. And um, they, the, the Chinese government um, has invested a lot in infrastructure, new airports, rail lines. And, and this part of China, it's in the, in the far west of China on the edge of the Gobi Desert. Um, they've had a lot of investment, so visitor numbers are up tremendously. And, and they know that it's a problem for the caves because the CO2 that we breathe damages the caves, so they have to limit numbers. And what they've done, before you, can, you were able to just drive up to the caves, get a guide, and, and then they take you through it, and the interpretation was done in the cave. But what, They've created this really state-of-the-art state of the art visitor center. You have to go there. You can't go to the caves by yourself anymore. And most of the interpretation takes place in the visitor center. They've recreated the caves. They have huge theaters. It's quite impressive. And then they shuttle people to the caves so you can still see the caves. Um, but, but, but you're, yeah, very, very briefly, you basically walk through it. And 
very little light because light damages as well. So these kinds of innovations are, are enable you know, higher numbers without the negative impact. So I think, I think you're right, James. I think China, just because they have to, because of the numbers, are, are really pushing the edge on and, that. And the other thing is, in China, they're having to come to grips with something that we don't really want to think about, which is limiting numbers. Mm -hmm. So w we have quite a romantic idea, certainly in England, that everybody can go everywhere. And it's a nice idea, and we all want to do it, but it doesn't really work when your visitor numbers are growing at 50% a year and have done for the last five years. Yeah. There comes a point where you have to say, actually, everybody can't come here. Yeah. Well, or, 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 or it's not, you know, because you're never going to get people to say you can't come. Yeah. And, and it is, it, you can look at it in terms of management. And management does mean numbers like the Alhambra, you know. You can come, but you just have to plan 10 months ahead before you can come. Gary, what's your experience in all the sites you visited? Are a lot of them well managed and... Do a lot of them now have time tickets to stop that overflow? In Europe, most of them are well managed. It really, it, it, there's a wide variety around the world. Uh, I've been, well, I tried to go to one place, I remember in a country, I couldn't even find it. There was no signage, there was nothing, no visitor center. And it had been a World Heritage site for several years. Uh, there are some places that have fantastic visitor centers and there's some where it's, you know, yeah. you just show up and they tell you where to go. Um, I remember one in Micronesia I went to, Nan Modal. At the time, it wasn't a World Heritage Site, but uh, we, we came up in a boat. There was someone sleeping. We gave him $2, and we were the only ones there. Lovely. And Nan Modal, I think, is on a par with Easter Island, and no one knows about it. I'm going to have to leave that there. I'd love to. There's a red light flashing at me. I just saw one question up there earlier. You can finish for me, Peter. What's the fourth? Oh, US? maritime. Oh, Gren yeah, Greenwich. <laughs> Should have asked you first. <laughs> Uh, you should go there, too. It's really interesting. <laughs> and it's very close by. Go and visit it today. Well, well it has, it all, you know, it, it's, it's inscribed according to certain criteria, obviously, but it's, it has the, the first the, uh, Renaissance building there that's extraordinary. And the Harrison clocks. Go and see it. It's a yeah. brilliant site. Thank you very much for your time, Peter. James, Guy, Joseph, and Gary, thank you very much, and thanks for your coming today. I hope you've enjoyed that. Thank you.